Treehouse products are crafted to bring you the best that legal, delivered-to-your-door THC has to offer. Treehouse utilizes unique blends of carefully selected minor cannabinoids that get you lit in ways you've only ever dreamed of. From Delta-8 vape pens with innovative blends of Delta-9 and THCP, to the tastiest HHC-infused syrups and hemp flower pre-rolls on the planet, Treehouse has got you covered. Ready to delight in dank gummies and puff powerful vapes? Head over to treehouse.com. That's T-R-E-H-O-U-S-E.com. There's only one E, not two, in treehouse.com. When you go there, get 30% off your order and a free Acapulco Gold HHC pre-roll. You can use the coupon code GENIUS. That's G-E-N-I-U-S. This offer expires August 31st, 2023. Grab your goodies and meet us for some fun in the treehouse. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Sydney Glassman. She's an assistant professor uh, in microbiology and plant pathology at University of California, Riverside. I'm going to talk about her research. So welcome, Sydney. Thanks for coming. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your background and how you got into studying uh, fungi, and then we'll go from there as to your research. Sure. So I got really excited about biology when I was a senior in high school, taking AP Biology. And then I went to my undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania, and I became a biology major there. And I got into fungi because I joined a lab at Penn, Dr. Brenda Casper. She was studying our vascular mycorrhizal fungi and how they affected plant growth after zinc smelter poisoning, I guess. It was a super fun thing. been affected by zinc. And and then I also studied abroad in Costa Rica. And I noticed we were hiking around and at night trying to look for herps, which is amphibians and lizards and things like that. And I, just, I was really excited about the plants and the fungi. And I was always asking about those. And my professor was like, okay, you can look at those during the day. We're looking for herps now. So I realized I was really fascinated by fungi. And then I joined a mycology lab for my PhD at UC Berkeley, Tom Bruns. And then I really became a full-fledged mycologist and just fell in love with mushrooms. Uh, I started hunting for them. I just find them really beautiful. I like eating them. I think it's really cool that it's something that most people don't even notice. But they're, once you start paying attention, they're everywhere. Fungi are really in many aspects of our everyday life. And they're just really understudied. And there's a lot of room for discovery, which is really exciting when you're a biologist. So what's your current uh, area of research about? Like, what are some of the research questions you're focused in on? Yeah, so in my lab at UC Riverside, I'm mostly studying the impacts of wildfires on soil microbiomes. And I've been doing this in, in really a lot of different systems. In Southern California, I've been working in chaparral, which is a type of shrubland that's adapted to wildfires and also in grasslands. And I've also sampled in Northern California in Redwood Tenna Forest and also in conifer forests in the Sierra Nevadas. I've also been working in conifer forests in, in Colorado and I've been looking at all sorts of questions about how wildfires impact soil bacteria and fungi and how that relates to ecosystem recovery after fires. Yeah, it's really interesting. Fire, like how deep into the soil do fires affect the soil? I know it probably depends on humidity and moisture and all the other stuff, but are there any general effects of fire that you've been able to catalog on soil? 
So that's a good question. So how deep the heat penetrates is based on severity. So that's going to be dependent on the density of the plants and like how hot the fire gets will be dependent on the density of the plants and the types of plants. So fires move really rapidly through grasslands, but they move a little bit slower through shrublands. And so the heat penetrates a lot deeper. Like for example, after the Holy Fire, which was a fire that occurred on in a shrubland on the border of or- Orange County and Riverside County that I sampled in, the ash was to our shins. So it was really, really high severity and the heat penetrated really far. But then, a, a sam- then I've been sampling after the Dome Fire, which burned down um joshua trees it killed a million it was on the like, front cover bear of the la times back in 2020 it burned a million joshua trees and because they're so dispersed there's not a lot of like dense vegetation above the fire moves really quick and there's almost no ash so the heat penetration is really low so in a, in a grassland a fast moving fire i guess actually maybe spares more of the soil than a slow moving one Exactly. So the soil microbes actually aren't really affected in most grassland fires or or even in the dome fire where all the Joshua trees died because the heat penetration is so low. The soil is pretty good incubator. So there might be some effects on soil like increased pH or increased nitrogen or increased phosphorus, but there's not a lot of heat induced mortality in those types of systems and their recovery is very quick. But then in these shrubland fires, which have you know, maybe 11 inches of, of ash, there's huge amounts of changes in really high heat, um, really high amounts of nitrogen release, and the heat penetration kills a lot of microbes. And, and even four years after fire, the fungal communities are not at all recovered. So if there's a substantial layer of ash on the ground, does that smother the ground? Does it create like a microenvironment that other creatures will take up? That's a good question. So the ash is in, in my, I use it more as a evidence of severity. So and that's just the plants dying and so and, and becoming ash. So that's to me just an indicator of how severe the fire is, which would indicate how um, much heat there was and how deep the heat penetrated. And I'm mostly sampling the soil beneath that. And in terms of what the ash does to, you said smothering, like smothering what? Animals? Well, the ground. Yeah. If um, like when, you, when you talked about, uh, you know, like a foot deep of ash. So, I mean, on the ground, that would prevent, I guess, oxygen exchange or at least filter through the ash. I just wonder what's... Um, if it creates a microenvironment in itself, if it insulates the ground, if it uh, smothers oxygen exchange and kills maybe aerobic bacteria in the top part of the soil, all those things come to mind. So it's really hydrophobic. And so it really affects water holding capacity because after fires, there's a lot of landslides. And one of the things that's happening is the soil becomes really hydrophobic and it also beca- releases a lot of waxes. The fires release a lot of waxes, which limit the water holding capacity and, and lead to things like landslides. And mostly though, the ash is usually blown away with the first rains. I and mean, then it might go into aquatic systems and have impacts there, um, which I don't study. But uh, yeah, usually it's, I would say it doesn't usually stick around like the whole year. After the first rains or winds, it will kind of get blown away or um, washed away. So the ash, I mean, it's just uh, what, carbon black or what is it composed of? And can it be a nutrient or a fuel for the soil or for new fungi or other plants that will grow through it? Yeah, so that's a good question. So that's one thing that we're trying to test is can it's pyrogenic organic matter or known as like biochar. And what is it made of? It's it's made of aromatic hydrocarbons. It can be pretty diverse depending on what actually burned. It's the dead plant material. So, you know, if it started as a chaparral or shrub or if it started as a tree, you know, it's going to have a little bit different chemical composition. But we are testing if fungi and bacteria that survive after fire. So I've been finding what's known as pyrophilus organisms. So they were basically undetectable pre-fire and then they kind of bloom after fire. So there are certain species of bacteria and fungi that are sur- that are selected for by fires and do really well after fires. And one hypothesis is that they might be able to eat pyrogenic organic matter. So we've been testing them. Out. Well, there must be something that signals certain mushrooms to grow. Maybe they have like, I'm just totally speculating, but you know, the body, they eat shock proteins, you know, in people. So maybe it's in uh, mycelium network. They're like heat shock type of compounds that get activated when there's a fire. And maybe there's stuff in the ash that, again, the mushrooms can use to help build themselves and, you know, some of the compounds. Yeah, that's a good hypothesis. So basically what we think is happening is there's a very diverse community of soil bacteria and fungi. And then a lot of them are killed after, especially a high severity fire. You might have 70 to 90 percent of the biomass lost and uh, maybe 60 to 80 percent of the number of species lost. And so then there's an opportunity for new microbes to come in that maybe were outcompeted before. And 
they might have some sort of traits that enable them to survive post-fire. Like they have really high thermal tolerance. Maybe it's from heat shock proteins or maybe it's from special, like some organisms produce heat tolerant spores. Some produce fungi have something called sclerotia, which heat resistant can be a heat resistant propagule or just something that can survive long periods, long stressful periods. And then but it also might be that they just are able to grow fast and, and get in after all this other all these competitors were, were moved away. Or maybe they are able to take advantage of the nutrients that are in that, like pyrogenic organic matter, or they can tolerate high nitrogen, for example, or high pH. Treehouse live rosin liquid diamond vape pens combine the impressive taste and potency of live rosin extract with the power of liquid THC diamonds to bring you an unrivaled buzz and mouth-watering flavor profile. If you like getting lit, Head over to treehouse.com. That's T R E H O U S E dot com. One E, not two. When you go there, take your vape game up to new heights. Enjoy 30% off your order and get a free Acapulco Gold HHC pre roll when you use coupon code Genius. Again, that's G E N I U S. Hurry because the offer expires August 31st, 2023. Treehouse, the best that legal, delivered to your door THC has to offer. Yeah, you know, I know you can't study everything, but I mean, would this take like a ton of study to figure out some of this stuff? Or, um, yeah, you know, again, I know you can't answer every question, but it sounds like this area maybe needs to be studied more. I don't know. Yeah, so I am funded by quite a few agencies right now. The United States Department of Agriculture, the Department of Energy, CAL FIRE are three grants, three agencies that I'm PI on grants for, and they're all funding me to study various aspects of how soil microbiomes are affected by wildfires. CAL FIRE is funding me mostly to look at how prescribed fires affect soil microbes because that's an area that they're really trying to increase the amount of prescribed fires in California. And then the USDA and DOE grants are more looking at uh, natural succession after wildfire and then also trying to test, you know, what we we're talking about. Like having these, I have some cultures of these pyrophilus organisms. I Over four years, I've isolated about over 500 organisms that are surviving wildfires in from various burn soils across California. And then we are testing their trait to see like, yeah, can they eat pyrogenic organic matter or can they, uh, we're, we're testing things like thermal tolerance, like the maximum survival rule temperature after we expose them to heat. So it does take a lot of effort because, you know, there's not that much known already. And so, there, you know, we kind of have to start pretty basic with a lot of these things. And then, of course, it requires people. But my lab has grown a lot in the last four years. I have currently have five PhD students, two postdocs and a lab manager, and then various amounts of undergrads who join my lab throughout the school year to help test these. So maybe a fire does destroy the existing microbiome of the soil, but this new one comes in very quickly to fill the void. Like, have you done experiments where, um, you know, outside a patch of ground and you have it surrounded so that you can you know, maybe take a flamethrower to it and you know, just burn it up for a minute and then look at before and after soil microbiome, you know, how it changes. But maybe that's what's happening or do you think pretty interesting microbiome stays, but just slightly changes or dramatically changes like what would you say so we're doing that in a couple of ways it, it's not that easy to just i, I don't want to people like you could just go out and throw a flamethrower on the ground because that's illegal no, and, most uh, people know but if for you like you're you know, a controlled experiment it's most really people, it's a get, terrible idea it's really hard to get permits to do that kind of thing we are collaborating with people who are already doing prescribed fires for example my cal fire grant i'm, I'm collaborating with um dr robert yark who is, is a professor at from UC Berkeley, and he uh, lives at the Blodgett Forest Research Station, and he's a burn boss. And so they have burns where they are doing prescribed burns. And then we went in and sampled before the prescribed burn, sequenced the soil, looked at the soil bacteria and fungi, and then we burned. And then we sampled after. And we've been sampling for many time points for two years after fire and examining how the soil microbiomes are affected in, in terms of the prescribed fire. And so we have done that. And then another way, my Department of Energy funding grant, what we're doing is we're actually taking what we call pyrocosms. So we buy buckets, galvanized steel buckets from like Home Depot, for example, fill them with soil. And we're taking soils from a variety of environments because we're curious how things differ in different biomes. So chaparral or grassland or mixed conifer forest. And then we are setting fires in those little buckets. So it's, it's almost kind of like a little barbecue, I guess, a really controlled experiment. And then we're testing things like fire severity. We Put the we we modulate fire severity with the amount of charcoal and so we're doing high severity and low severity fires and seeing how the microbes are affected in that way what are you noticing like are you doing metagenomics of let's say the soil microbiome before and after to see if function changes or you're looking just for the absence or presence of different species 
Yeah, so that's a good question. We're going to do everything. So we haven't set these prior cosmos yet. We're going to do it in August. And we are going to sequence 16S and ITS to look at amplicon sequencing of bacteria and fungi to look at the communities and how they're differing. But we are also going to do metagenomes to look at the functions and metatranscriptomes as well. And we're also going to look at viruses too. I have a collaborator at UC Davis who's going to look at viruses. And then we're going to test how those changes in the soil microbiomes impact greenhouse gases. Oh, okay. So this is so early that really very little is known about the before and after burn characteristics of the soil. Well, there is some research from, as I said, prescribed fires. I also have two times in my PhD, I had plots where I was studying the soil fungi. I, I was not asking questions about fire. I was looking at the ectomycorrhizal fungi and studying how they were distributed across North America. And then my plots burned down in catastrophic megafires. This happened not once, but twice in my PhD. Once my plots burned in the 2013 Rim fire, which burned the Stanislaw National Forest abutting Yosemite National Park. And then in 2016, the Soberanus fire burned down some plots I'd been studying, some redwood tannock plots I'd been studying in Big Sur. So I did actually have plots that where I'd sampled before and then after a catastrophic megafire. And so I was able to detect not only was the communities reduced a lot by fire, but there were certain tac- uh, species, these pyrophilus microorganisms I mentioned, that did really increase after. Would it be worth it to take regular soil and, you know, sample it and throw a bunch of ash on top and let it sit there for a couple of weeks and sample the soil again? I know you got the burn in the meantime, but I don't know if that would be useful. Maybe not. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of different aspects that are changed by fire. And so if you want to disentangle the heat from the ash, that is one thing you can do. And there, I don't want to say there's not a literature on this because there is. A lot of people are really interested in biochar. And how it affects, especially in terms of farming. And so there is research showing when you amend soils with biochar, how it's affected by soil bacteria and fungi. So there is something known about that. And then uh, I am taking basically unburned soils and, and burning them in these pyrocosm buckets to test the exact impact of fire and fire severity on those soil bodies. Yeah, but would, uh, does naked soil burn or do you have to have uh, plant cover on top of it? We're using charcoal and we're providing uh, fuel by, by using charcoal and like newspaper. And some like pine needles, basically. Oh, but but again, out of the wild, you know, if there's a fire going wherever in California, uh, you know, let's say it burns up a tree and then there's, I don't know, 30 feet of soil around it. Will it burn the soil or will it just kind of jump over the soil or will it just sit there and go nowhere? Like uh, what, what kinds of soil can bury it, prevent fires or, or none of it can? Yeah, if there's nothing there, it won't burn. It'll jump over. So that's why, like, if you, fi- firefighters will tell you to have a fire break around your house. If you do live in an area where there's lots of fires, you definitely don't want to have, like, trees touching your house at all. <laughs> like, I mean, you could do things to protect your house from fires by, you know, having raw, you know, bare soil or things that are not flammable around your house. So you definitely don't want vegetation touching your house. Having, having vegetation as far from possible from your house is a way to protect yourself from fires. And so, yeah, if you don't have, if you have bare land. So, like, for example, one of the reasons prescribed fires work is because forests can get really dense. I mean, then there's a lot of fuel and then it'll burn really hot. But if you thin out the forest with either cutting or, or a prescribed fire that's like kind of low severity and just burns the little trees or sort of like not like the shrubs and things, not necessarily the big adult trees, then the idea is that the fires will move through more quickly and burn out quicker and won't be as soon. Okay. You said that, uh, well, again, I know you can't study everything. So you've been focused more on the fungi, but do you have an analog or someone in your lab that focuses on the bacteria and that you focus on the fungi? Everyone in my lab studies the bacteria and fungi. Oh, okay. The impacts of fire on both bacteria and fungi. Okay, so what do you see as the main differences between the fate of the fungi and the fate of the bacteria? It sounds like the fungi could be affected for decades, at least a couple of examples, but what about the bacteria? Like, how does the interplay between the two change and the, the populations and everything? So they're both, especially in the high severity fires, they can both be pretty negatively affected by having really large declines in biomass and number of species and really big changes in community composition. But generally speaking, bacteria will recover faster. They will recover to their to their former biomass and number of species and composition a lot faster than the fungi will. Oh, the ba- yeah, because the bacteria gets divide a lot faster and move a lot faster, right? Yeah, they're generally more resilient. Why do you think they're more resilient? Is it because the mycelium just have tons of surface area so they're very delicate and they can get burned up easily or no they're small they reproduce fast they generate so quickly that they and then they have such high dispersal rates that it's just easier for them to recover. well also they can move easier i guess if they need to and they're smaller and the surface area to volume ratio is like you know dramatically smaller than that of like you know long i'd say i guess so it's, it's not necessarily that they survive the actual like heat of the fire better, but they can recover faster because they are able to disperse in from either like kind of lower in the soil column or, or from the air for the wind. 
or maybe animals moving through and pooping in uh, the environment. Well, what happens if, you know, I know it's not, not a nice thing, but if you selectively burn part of a uh, mycelium network, what does the rest of the network do? Have you ever looked at that? You know, let's say again, an area burns and like half of a certain fungus is uh, mycelium is in the path of the burn and half's not. Does it, does it recover better that way or do the burn parts never recover? Like what happens? That would be so hard to study. <laughs> That's a really challenging question to answer. I mean, there's not like that many fungi that are that big. I mean, you've heard of like the humongous fungus and how that can be acres. But generally speaking, most fungi don't necessarily have like that large of uh, what they call genet size. So like the mycelium, that's like all the same exact species. I would think that most like the whole genet would be burned in a fire because the fire is so large compared to the body size of the fungus. I, the only fungus I could think of that you could potentially even study that with is something like the humongous fungus in, in Michigan and in Oregon. They have another one. So like maybe that would be large enough and then it's well studied enough like where the genet is that you could test that. But I really don't know. It would be something that would be extremely challenging to study in, in most cases. Well, I don't know. What if you have one in the lab and you just, you know, tice it to grow, uh, you know, lengthwise somehow so that it's, uh, let's say, a foot long. And again, you, you burn part of it, keep the burn away from the other part. Do you think you could do that or would that not give you clear data? You mean set it on fire like with a match and then blow it out? Like a really small? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just picturing like, I don't know, let's say a 10 gallon tank and, uh, you know, I have some fungi growing in there and I go to one side of the tank and I just go, you know, a little torch and maybe like burn the ground there or burn the mycelium there, but I don't burn the other side. Maybe that uh, you'd be able to see what goes on on the other side that's still, you know, unburned, how it reacts to it. Well, if it's in the soil, it'd be hard to test if, if it's like the exact same mycelium. But yeah, I, I really have no idea. Like there's some studies that show how, for example, like herbivory, like you can have a fungus and one hyphae it's growing and, and then there's might be and like in the millipede or some sort of insect like eating one end of it and then they it does show that that they can produce anti-herbivory agents and different types of molecules and compounds that spread to different parts of the body and then prime the rest of the body uh against being eaten and so there's research on that and so i would imagine that maybe um heating it on one part of it could potentially induce transcription of possibly heat tolerance uh proteins if it had them which I don't really know if it did, um, or maybe it could induce sporulation if it had thermal tolerance spores. So I, I could imagine a scenario where, where that might have an effect. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe a research question for the future. Okay. So what, what uh, research questions do you feel like you're getting close to getting some good answers on? So one paper that we just published in molecular ecology was looking at the microbial secession after a severe chaparral fire. And basically the vegetation response to uh, chaparral uh, fire is pretty well understood. It is a trouble that's adapted to fire. And we know that the succession of plants that occurs after the fire, they're not the same as they were. I and mean, it usually takes maybe 15 years, uh, 15 to 30 years to recover. But we, the shrublands that were there before, but we know that this pattern of secession occurs. And so we found that actually a really distinct pattern of secession for both bacteria and fungi occurred after the chaparral fire. As I had mentioned, it's known, it's been known for quite a long time, like, oh, over 100 years that pyrophilus microbes exist. So like if you burn soil, fungi that were not detectable pre-fire came out and bloomed after a fire. And so that's that's been known for a long time. But then the rates of turnover and their, their patterns of secession or change over time have not been known. And so we're seeing now that there is a really strong rates of turnover and also that certain organisms, they sort of trade off in abundance. So some come out really fast. For example, right after the fire, we had these uh, geminibacidium yeast. So they're thermotolerant yeast that probably like survive the fire and can grow really fast because they're yeast, single-celled organisms. And then after 17 days, 17 to 25 days, they started to decline really quickly. And then pyronema, which is a filamentous ascomycete fungus, which is maybe surviving the fire from scler thermotolerant sclerotia, it started to grow. It probably took longer to grow because it's filamentous. And then it was dominant for maybe two to three months after fire. And then it started to decline. As these other fungi, Aspergillus and Penicillium, which are really, really widespread kind of molds in the ascomycetes that we know can produce a ton of asexual spores and they can grow extremely fast. And they started increasing a lot as the pyronema started to decline. And so we're seeing these, these rates of fast turnover in the communities, similar to what we found in plants, and that there's the turnover is probably driven by traits of the microbes, like maybe the thermotolerant microbes survive first. 
and then things that grow fast come in. And then towards the end of the year, things that like baby can eat pyrogenic organic matter come in way later at the end of the year. So we're starting to get a really clear picture of secession and microbial turnover after fires and relating that to their traits, which is getting us to the point of what we know about plants. That's like my sort of my goal is to really get our knowledge of a fungal response to fire to that of plants. So because we know a lot about how plants respond to fire and traits they have that enable them to survive fire. Like, for example, some of them can vegetatively resprout or some of them have thick bark. And I'm, I'm trying to get those same traits in the in the mic. And we are moving. Very, very interesting. Any other near-term breakthroughs you didn't understand and you think that you know, may or may not play out next year? Any other research questions that yeah. would be interesting to you? So one question, I mentioned I have money from Cal Fire, and one question that they have with their, and actually the governor of California is putting a lot of money into prescribed fire. People are really, really curious about how can we expand the amount of acres that are experiencing prescribed fire because we want to be able, as I, I mentioned earlier, like how prescribed fire might reduce the mega fires because if you have really dense forests, there's a lot of fuel that can be burned. But if you thin it out or have like a low severity prescribed fire, then you can get rid of this vegetation that might, or the fuel that might burn really hot. And then the trees that might be left alive and they can survive. And then there would be hopefully less occurrence of these severe mega fires, which can burn up to a million acres at a time. That's what we had down in California. The August fire burned a million acres in, in 2020. And that was really bad. There's a lot of interest about how can we expand prescribed fire. But there's issues because people don't want prescribed fires in their backyard. They're worried about smoke and they're worried about fire, prescribed fires getting out of hand and turning into wildfires. There's like, you have to have very specific moisture conditions and temperature conditions for prescribed fires to happen. You have to have a fire truck that's available. So it can't be like during peak fire season when there's no fire trucks available. So there's, there's limits on when you can burn. And our natural wildfire season in California is summer and fall. And one way that you potentially could increase the amount of prescribed fires is to do them in spring. And so what we're asking is how does the impacts of prescribed fire in spring versus fall affect soil microbiomes? Like, are you are the spring fires ecologically similar to the fall fires? And so far, we're finding they're not really. The spring fires are having a lot less impact on the soil bacteria and fungi than the fall fires. Yeah, I mean, there's certain mushrooms that seem to rapidly, well, some guy that rapidly appear and actually produce fruiting bodies, mushrooms and fires, right? Yeah. So they must be eating pyrogenic material to grow so fast all of a sudden to get the signal to grow. So what do you think that signaling is in those kinds of uh, fungi that appear, you know, first after a fire? I'm not sure I understood your question. What do you mean signaling? Like the si fungi are signaling to each other? No, I mean, if there's a fire, there's, there's going to be a, a species of fungi that probably grows first, you know, out of the, the burned area. So I would think that that species, whatever it may be, or multiple species, they're the ones that can eat the pyrogenic material because otherwise, why would they appear so quickly and only through a fire like that? Yeah, so that's actually not what I think is happening. I think that the things that survive, that appear quickest are the things that are thermotolerant. So they just survive because they actually have the ability to, sur to sur withstand. We've seen this for bacteria, the firmicutes, which have thermotolerant endospores, pop up first after fire. And for fungi, the as I mentioned, the geminibicidium yeast, which is a thermotolerant yeast, and pyronema, which probably has thermotolerant sclerotia survive first. So whether or not they can eat pyrogenic organic matter is is an open question, but there's a lot of dead bodies like necromass of bacter dead bacteria and fungi that's around that, that they could eat. So I don't think they necessarily have a shortage of food because basically the heat comes in, kills everything, and then the things that can thermotolerant have the ability to thermotolerant do, and then they just eat everything else that died. So I actually think the things that can eat pyrogenic organic matter take a little bit longer to come. Oh, so it could be that just their competitors are out of the way, so then they proliferate, but not necessarily they're eating some of the pyrogenic matter. Yeah, that's what I think is happening. That's what our evidence shows so far. I mean, we're still testing this, but based on the the research that based on like what I found in in terms of the patterns of secession in Southern California, chaparral fires, that's what I think is happening. They yeah, the competitors are removed. They can eat all basically they're eating the competitors, dead bodies. And then, and then over time, these microbes that probably can eat pyrogenic organic matter or high nitrogen substrates from the fire, those disperse in and then, and then they are, they're taking probably a little bit longer to arrive. I don't think it's likely that many of them are thermotolerant and can survive the fire. They maybe are coming. What are they eating if, uh, you know, if, if all the materials have been burned up? What are, which ones eating the thermotolerators or yeah, the, right. The thermal tolerant fungi yeah. and, you know, yeasts and, and other creatures like I know the competition is vastly reduced or gone, but what are they consuming that's left there? Yeah. Enough material that 
So the the fungi and bacteria that died, they are leaving behind probably like a lot of easily accessible nutrient carbon sources, sugars, lipids that probably the thermosol radiators can eat. Don't get burned up in the fire. You know, obviously fires are so heterogeneous. Like it's really hard because even a really high severity fire will have a lot of patches that are not burned. So there's always going to be like some amount of plant material or soil that like survive. So, you know, there's very little like lower severity fires are even more heterogeneous, but even high severity fires can be really heterogeneous. So like you can have like a patch where it's really hot. Like, for example, like a tree burns and like the trunk has like a total burnout. But then right next to it where there wasn't anything to burn, like there was no plant material and then the fire just moved through quickly. And so the soil is basically all alive. So it's not like there's no situation where it's going to be like a complete like nuke zone where like everything is just fully burnt. Like there's always going to be patches of surviving either plant material or oil that wasn't burned and that would have food. Okay. Well, very good. What's the best place for people to find out more about your research? Where can they go? I have a website, Sydney Glassman at wordpress.com. I have information on all my projects, all my publications up to date there, members of my lab and just a website on the UC Riverside plant microbiology and plant pathology faculty web page as well. Right. Well, very good, Sydney. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you for interviewing me. Remember, before you go, you've got to check out treehouse.com. That's T-R-E, only one E, T-R-E-H-O-U-S-E dot com. They offer an array of premium legal THC products, including gummies, vapes, pre-rolls, and more. And they're all delivered right to your doorstep. With unique blends of carefully selected cannabinoids, all rigorously lab tested to ensure quality and consistency, Treehouse products give you the buzz you simply can't get anywhere else. Head over to treehouse.com. That's T R E H O U S E dot com. Remember, there's one E, not two. And enjoy 30% off your order and get Acapulco Gold HHC pre rolls when you use the coupon code Genius at checkout. Hurry because the offer expires August 31st, 2023. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.